Hello, it's Pastor Larson with Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida, inviting you to our Bible study. And the Bible study is under the theme of the Lord loves to hear us pray. The Lord loves to hear us pray. Last time we were together, we found some fascinating answers to a few prayers in the book of Acts. But we didn't finish. There are about nine more that I have recorded for us. So let's see together how the early church prayed as recorded by the evangelist St. Luke. The answers to those prayers remind us that the Lord loves to hear us pray. By the way, answered prayers are not the proof that prayer works, but the evidence to our hearts that God loves so very us, loves us so very much that he does indeed hear and answer according to his will. I do not like to say prayer works. I would rather give all glory to God, for it belongs to him alone, and say God works. He works everything together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That's recorded in Romans 8.28, as some of you know. Answered prayers are helpful to us. And that's why we're using these examples from the book of Acts. The first one, um, well, no, no, before we get to that, I want to remind us that we're trying to answer three basic questions as we study these prayers. Who is praying and what did they pray? If we know, sometimes the text doesn't tell us what they prayed. And then what was the result if, if that is reported to us? And again, some of the examples that we have do not have items two and three. But let me add a fourth uh, question, right? Uh, how does this encourage us to pray? And you won't always have an answer to that question either, although you can, uh, you can make it up, all right? The first is from Acts chapter 10. And um, can I ask Chris to read this, please? It has three pages. If you're willing to read the 16 verses, Chris. What happened to Chris? On Chris. Mute. I, I'm sorry. Okay. Acts 10, 1 through 16. At Caesarea, or Caesarea. See, Caesarea. That's a, yeah. Caesarea. There was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision, an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius, and he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to him, he sent them to Joppa. Next day, as they were on their journey, approaching the city, Peter went up to the, the housetop at the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens open, something like a great sheet descending being led down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happens, happened three times, and 
and the things were taken up at once to heaven. So this is an interesting uh, opening. It's an opening for Peter as Peter, a Jew, at this point in his life, does not realize, he doesn't realize at all, that God wants to bring the Gentiles also to faith in Jesus Christ, for he died for all. He did not just die for the Jewish people, the sins of the Jewish people. He died for all. So now Peter needs to have this experience, this experience in which the key verse is, do not call unclean what God has made clean. And another word for uh, unclean is, is common, the things we wouldn't use because they were prohibited by the Mosaic law. You understand what is going on there? Do you have any questions about what happened before? Actually, I got lost in reading it. How did it go from Cornelius to Peter? All right. It was a transition there that when I'm reading it, I'm saying, well, wait a minute. All right. Now, thank you for uh, bringing that up. What we have in the first scene is Cornelius. And Cornelius is praying. All right. Uh, Cornelius is a proselyte. He has not become a Jew. He cannot become a Jew. He's a Gentile. And Cornelius is a soldier. He is a centurion. Now, he is given this, um, this vision, this message, all right? And he, he answers, and, and God is answering his prayer with this vision. And so the angel tells him uh, to go and send for some people uh, in a city named Joppa, people who he has never heard of. In fact, he, he tells him to send for Peter. So verse 9 there at the bottom of the page, the next day, there is a change of scene. Peter is praying at the sixth hour, and the way they numbered time, that meant is about noon. It was time for Peter's lunch, but he is up on the housetop, and he is praying as a devout Jew would pray three times a day. Well, Peter's hungry. He wants something to eat. While he's eating, okay, this is the scene. Waiting. Waiting. What? Does someone have a question? While he's waiting. While he's waiting. While he's waiting for lunch, is <laughs> what I'm saying. He's, uh, but he's praying. Okay, is that is that how you read it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So now... It sounds like Peter is giving, uh, being given a test by God. Yeah. But it's not really a test. It's a change in the way you look at things. So that's the second scene. I'm not going to read all the words again, but the main sentence is what God has made clean, do not call common. In other words, the Gentiles also will be invited into the kingdom of God by the preaching of the gospel of Jesus. Mm -hmm. It happened three times, which is often what happens in scripture, and it's for emphasis and for repetition, and Peter never forgot this. I see very clearly now, you explained right. it, and I see the break off there, and right. it, it's such an important thing, I didn't realize. Yes, if you were reading this in the Bible, you would have paragraph marks, and maybe a, a blank line that would help your eyes and your mind to see it. Now, I want to tell you what happens next, but we're not going to read verses 17 through 43. I'm just going to summarize it for you. While Peter is wondering what the vision meant, wouldn't you wonder what this vision meant? Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And there's these unclean animals in there. You have to go back to Leviticus chapter 11, to read about the unclean animals, certain birds and certain reptiles were not to be eaten. All right, that separates, it does two things. It protects the Jews from certain illnesses, and also it, it, it gives them a separation from all the other people in the world. 
God many times gave them directions to separate themselves from the people of the world who did not honor or believe so we're God. So Peter's wondering what the vision meant. While he is up there, Cornelius's messengers come to Peter's door. This is not a coincidence. The Lord's timing is perfect. So the Spirit told Peter to go down with these men uh, and see these men. There's no doorbell. They're <laughs> calling for him. So Peter went with them to Cornelius's home. That was the command that they had been given to bring him here. Imagine what Peter was thinking then. Cornelius tells Peter about his prayer and how he was directed by the holy angel to send for Peter. Okay, so Peter says, well, I'm here. And they said, we are here to hear all that God has given you to say to us. You talk about open ears and open hearts. What pastor wouldn't uh, love a congregation like that? So Peter preached the gospel of Jesus. It was short as far as the record in the book of Acts. He preached the gospel. It of says Jesus. my video is muted. My. Your video is muted. I'm not understanding. Peter preached the gospel of Jesus to Cornelius and his Gentile guests, and the Holy Spirit brought them to faith. He recognized that God shows no partiality. It might be good if if uh, each of you would now uh, mute your, your mic. Do you know how to do that? Yep. And we'll, and we'll wait for the sound to go away. Yeah. So Peter baptized those who were assembled, and they were all Gentiles. And this is a big door of opening. Uh, so we're getting back to our message today is the idea that the Lord loves to hear us pray. And so we were trying to say, who is praying? Who is praying in this account from chapter 10 of Acts? Aren't there two different people praying? Peter, Peter is one of them. And the other is? Cornelius? That's right. And their prayers have a common aim, but they don't know that yet. So what do they pray? We don't know. The content of the prayer isn't given to us. Right? And what was the result? It's a huge result in the history of the Christian church. What is the result? Uh, Peter was able to uh, witness. Yes. And uh, the witness. witness to the Gentiles. Yes. And what changed inside of Peter's um, mind and heart about the Gentiles? Uh, basically, they're all people too. Uh, uh, and people that could, could receive God's, God's word and, and be saved. That's exactly right. We, uh, we live in an age where uh, uh, this is sometimes an issue all over the world, the gospel is being preached. It's to many nations in many languages. The Bible has been translated into almost 2,000 languages around the world, or at least parts of the Bible. And the gospel is going out. There is no one excluded. For everyone who believes in Jesus, who calls upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Romans chapter 10, echoing the Old Testament. The Old Testament never said the Gentiles couldn't come in. In fact, the Jews were told to invite them. They didn't do a very good job of it. Well, that's another long story we can't get into. But you've got the nub of it. Let's go on to another uh, prayer. We already answered the questions. 
except for how does this encourage us to pray, especially for missions. The reason that you and I don't pray for missions very often is that we don't have a content. We don't even have a continent. <laughs> so that's something you can get into. This morning, I looked upon a prayer request from the Lutheran Bible translators, and uh, they have a page, and then you can uh, go on the Lutheran Bible translators page, and you can pray for the missionaries who are translating the Bible into other languages and bringing the gospel to the people to whom they have been sent. There is a worldwide ministry uh, counting in, in the hundreds of thousands of people who are there speaking to one or two or three or maybe 500. It's, uh, you'll never catch up with it in all your life. But the encouragement is for us to pray for people who do not yet know Jesus. If you want specifics, you go to the various missionary pages. The Lutheran Church Missouri Synod has those pages attached to lcms.org. I'll just leave it at that, okay? Okay. Prayers in the book of Acts. Before we read from Acts chapter 12, I want to set the scene. Here's what had happened before we get to our text. Herod killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. Whether he did it himself or had it done, we can't tell. Well, Herod saw that this pleased the Jews, so he arrested Peter, probably intending to kill him as well. But because he wanted peace uh, above all costs, at all costs, he was waiting until the Passover was over. All right. Well, the night before Herod was going to have Peter killed, an angel comes to rescue Peter in answer to many prayers. Now we're anticipating this quote from Acts chapter 12, and I need a volunteer to read here from Acts 12, verse 5, and then 11 through 12. I can do that. Please. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. Rhoda answers the door. Yeah, I wanted us to remember Rhoda because we had trouble remembering that a couple of weeks ago. I'm not telling you the whole story except the prayers that were being prayed. So the answer, the question is, who is who is praying? Verse five. The church. The church. And who else is praying? Well, I think that Peter was praying. Peter, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't say in so many words. But uh, <laughs> this was a surprise, a, a, a wonderful surprise because he felt that he was going to die within a day or two. And uh, now I am sure after he was uh, let out of prison by the angel, the door just opened. This was not the earthquake kind of thing. This was just the earthquake happens in uh, Acts chapter 16. And we'll get to that later. Um, the artist's depiction of what this might have looked like to Peter when the angel came and rescued him. Peter was praying. What did he pray? What was the church praying? Obviously. That he wouldn't die. Yeah. And uh, that we'd be released from prison, don't you think? And, uh, and the prayer was answered. So that was the result. Uh, he was imprisoned unjustly. Right? He, he, he wasn't disobeying any of the orders of the government of Herod. So he was uh, let out of prison. And this encourages us to pray 
for people who are in prison, whether they are kept there unjustly or justly, because that's not our business. We are not in that arm of the government, you and I. I don't think anybody in our congregation is involved in that. But what we are involved is praying for those in prison, or anybody that is in prison, that they might be treated well, that they might have what they need for their bodily needs, that they might have an opportunity for Bible study. And if they have not yet come to faith in Jesus, that that might happen while they're in prison. See, for some people, prison is a time to reflect on what is true and good and important and right and righteous. Not a time to be angry and resentful. And God can make those changes, and he has many, many times. But that's not the import of our lesson. Our, we're talking about prayer. There are many people that need our prayers. Many, many, many people. If you keep at it, your prayer list will grow and grow and grow. Well, I have to click this to get it back in frame. No, I'll, I'll, I've got some hard names here, so I'll volunteer to read because I have a self-pronouncing Bible that tells me where to put the accents. Believe it or not, the accent comes on the first syllable of Manaen. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, and Saul. While they were worshiped the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and prayer, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. I want to tell you that this is the first of three missionary journeys that St. Luke writes about in the book of Acts. Saul, also named Paul, well, Paul is his Greek name, um, he has been commissioned by Jesus in person to be an apostle to the Gentiles. So he is not going to stay in Judea, not going to stay in Palestine. He has been sent out by this church, which is a very fast-growing church, a Gentile church in Antioch. And there were in that church some people who were um, given by God into the office of pastor or prophet and teacher. And five of them are named there. So I don't know whether they were having a worship service or not. I mean, I didn't know uh, what they had prayed, but they were worshiping and they were fasting and they were ready for the Lord to direct them. They were open to the Lord's bidding. And then uh, they have this message from the Holy Spirit that comes either through a vision or a voice, we, we aren't told. And after fasting and prayer, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. The importance of the prayer, well, we aren't told what they prayed. What did they pray? What do you think? What would you speculate that this the church in Antioch prayed? That they could find some disciples to send out. All right. What, what kind of success would they be expecting as they went out into lands where the message of Jesus had not been heard. If you were a missionary or going with missionaries, what would you pray? That God would show you who should go. Who should go, number one, and then after having sent them off, what would they pray for then? Oh, their, their well-being and success. Well-being, success, safety. And that they get many more followers for Jesus. Yeah, that's the work of the Lord. 
All they had to do was bring the message of Jesus, and that would bring hearts to faith in him. Because the power of the gospel is the power of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation, said St. Paul, for everyone who believes, comma, the Jew as well as the Greek. And there you have a word used that means the rest of the Gentile world. So here was Paul going into what we sometimes in the Bible call Asia Minor. And he's going to cities and towns on islands, and he is going to what is now Turkey. Okay? There were once many churches in ancient Turkey in the time of the New Testament. I don't know whether, whether you knew that, but some of them are named in the Bible, like uh, Ephesians, but, uh, excuse me, Ephesus and Colossae. And then Paul will go later on to Greek uh, islands and to the, the country that we now call Greek, although then it was two major countries. And he will go to Philippi and other towns, including Corinth, and preach the gospel there. Paul started several churches, and they are named in the book of Acts. It's an exciting journey, and I urge you to read the entire 28 chapters, oh, a chapter a day or half a chapter a day, and get the full story. But we're studying prayer. Back to that, okay. So they prayed, and what they prayed, we are not told. We speculated, and the result was the gospel was preached. We know that by reading the rest of the, the story in Acts chapters 14 and 15 and 16 and 17, and as we go on. So we can't tell the whole story in one sentence. <laughs> but the gospel took root, and many churches were started. It's a long story, and it's only 2,000 years old. I want you to get a, a, a sense of the Spirit of God going out into the world using ordinary people. Yeah. Well, we've, we've got the encouragement to pray for those who are missionaries in the world today. Uh, I would like another reader, please. Acts 14, 19 to 23, please. Who has it read today? Um, <clears throat> I got a scratchy voice, but if you, oh, want... you can try. We'll, we'll I'll give it a try. Yes. It's from Acts 14, 19 through 23. I've got but some water for you. Here. I've got my tea. I've been sipping it. But it's part of this whole, what I'm going through. Uh, the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derby. When they had preached the gospel to the city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. This is a uh, retracing his steps. Uh, Paul and Silas are coming back to Antioch. And on their way back, they stayed at the same cities, or most of the same cities, strengthening the souls of the disciples and encouraging them to continue in the faith. And then one of the favorite quoted sentences in the New Testament, we must through many tribulations. Yeah. Enter the kingdom. I find it interesting that he would... He was courageous enough 
to go back to the cities where they to, to the peoples that had stoned him and left him for dead. Uh, there is a courage in St. Paul, you are certainly correct, that uh, pervades the entire second half of the book of Acts. And you also hear it in his voice when he writes to the churches in the letters that we have in the New Testament. Uh, Paul is strong. Remember what he has gone through. Remember what he was, a Pharisee of Pharisees, well-schooled, a student of Gamaliel. And now he suffers. Before he even started on this journey, or any of his journeys, he was told in person by Jesus that here is what you're going to suffer for my name's sake. But he did not flinch, and he kept going, and he kept going, and he kept going until he was martyred. The book of Acts ends in chapter 28 with him under house arrest and being served by the other disciples. They bring him food and other needs. Um, he is in prison and expecting that one day they would come for him and he would be executed in some fa fashion. Uh, there's a lot of tradition that follows Acts 28, but that's the end of the story as far as what God wanted us to know. There is no Acts 29 telling us what happened next. Well, I'm on a tangent, uh, but it's I think it's a worthwhile tangent because you brought up his courage. Yep. So now at, at the end of this passage in, in verse 23, and when they had appointed elders for them, the word elder in the New Testament is not the kind of elder that we have in the church today. The word elder in the church then was equivalent to pastor and teacher. The word elder in the New Testament, they use other words. Uh, one is uh, the word episkopoi, that's overseer. And the other uh, sounds like a denomination, presbyteroi. And those were the two offices in the church and they're called by the common name of elder. As you study uh, First Timothy and Second Timothy and Titus, you realize that the equivalence is made there. So after they appointed the elders, they prayed for them. I want you to notice, and I think you have probably all noticed by now, that with prayer uh, often comes fasting. It was a practice of the Jews uh, to fast at various times. Uh, some of those were commanded. When we get to the New Testament, the command to fast is gone, but the practice continues. That's something that we could study another time. But they, uh, they were, that means a readiness, and they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And then Paul would go on. Paul was the most he ever stayed at one of the churches. I believe it was he was in Ephesus for two or three years, and he was in Corinth for two or three years. But otherwise, Paul moved on. He did not become what we call a parish pastor today. Um, there was no, uh, no beautiful house in which he owned and lived, and Paul traveled light. So who was praying? The church was praying. They were praying for the uh, people who were appointed elders. Paul was praying for them, and as he was leaving, he committed them to the Lord's care and keeping, and uh, he went on. The result, we aren't told, except later on you can discover that churches were built up in these areas. So that was God's working in answer to their prayers. And that should encourage us to pray uh, you were members of Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church of Delray Beach, Florida. I want you to remember that the, the, the leaders of the church and the workers in the church need your prayers and they need your encouragement. You can do that. All right. Uh, who would like to read from Acts uh, 16? 25 to 34, and this is a couple of pages long, I believe, yes. I'll read 
read it. Okay, back to Chris. Acts 16, 25 to 34. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison was shaken. The foundation of the prison was shaken. And immediately, all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he threw the door and was about to kill him. Supposing that the prisoners had escaped, the Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights and rushed in, and truly here he fell down before Paul and Silas. All right, I want you to pause now. I want to do something. I'm going to ask everyone. Well, I, I have to, if I say everyone, I have to mute myself. I want everyone to reach up in the right hand corner of their little screen and look for the word mute and mute your mic. And uh, we're going to find out if we can, uh, the noise has, uh, has interfered with our understanding of the words that Chris was reading. I you think that? Carla is the one who's never muted. And she looks like she's on a cell phone. Who, who, who is that? Carla. Carla. Okay, Carla, did, did you just mute? I guess. I she's leaving listening. I don't know. Okay. Carla oh, is still, oh, then now she muted. I, I just did that. So I can do that. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. That's a better way for you. Oh, well, anyway, that's a better way for you to mute everybody at this point. Yeah, but when we have a discussion, of course, that's different. I'm sorry about this. Now, it stopped, didn't it? Yes. It might have been. Um, it stopped because I found another way to mute. Even another, though it says my microphone was muted, I, I did another way. Okay. Okay. Oh, well, that seems to have fixed it. Okay. So the rest of you can unmute. Oh, I'm sorry about that. All right, we didn't know. All right, well, let's, we'll go on. So we've got uh, Paul and Silas are in prison, and uh, <laughs> this is an exciting chapter, and I don't want to diminish it at all. The prison doors were open because the foundations of the prison were shaken by the earthquake. Paul cries with a loud voice, do not harm yourself. And the reason he does that is that if a guard is found to have allowed prisoners to escape, the guard dies. That's the rule. That's the, that's the law. You are responsible for the safety and keeping of all of your prisoners. If any of them escape, you die. So they took their job very seriously don't you think so yeah. seriously that he was about to kill himself rather than be killed because of the prisoners escaping did you get all that when you read it yes okay i was distracted by the noise so the jailer called for lights <laughs> these are these are lamps probably with olive oil or some other oil. He fell down before Silas and the artist has depicted it. Now, Chris, would you go on and read 30 through 34, please? Then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, and you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Who was praying? Verse 25. Oh, yeah. 
Paul and Silas. Yeah. What were they praying? It doesn't say. What do you guess they were praying? Get out. Yeah. They have work to do. What's their work? They're spreading the gospel everywhere they go. Can I ask a question here? Because oh, if, if the jailer did all that, did he, did he end up being killed? Because no. Well, <laughs> I said no too quickly. The, the correct answer is don't speculate. You know, my, my, my rules about not reading into scripture what's not there. It's a real firm rule. So I can't say no. I, I, the real answer is we don't know. Um, if, if I were the jailer, I would take up a new identity in another town. <laughs> I don't know. Um, did the Lord, did they pray that the Lord would, we just aren't given the message. If you go on and read in the next chapter of Acts, you would not find him brought up again. He's never again a subject. But they're praying and they're singing hymns to God. And listen, the other prisoners are listening to him, uh, to Paul and Silas praying and singing. They're witnessing in, in the prison. And you know that goes on in the prisons of the world today? It has always been that Christians who are imprisoned use it as an opportunity, or they may use it as an opportunity to, to pray and to witness their faith. So it's a good question, Chris, but the answer is, I don't know. If he were known and discovered, it's a probability. But what if, <laughs> I don't take death um, I take death seriously. I sure do. I don't want to live. Okay. But here's what happens. He comes to faith in Jesus. His whole family. He's baptized. And his, his, his first work of faith, his good works after his comes to faith, is to feed Paul and Silas. And he rejoiced that he had believed in God. God brought him to faith in Jesus as his savior. Now, what if the next day he is discovered and he is executed? Well, he is with the Lord in heaven forever. He has suffered the loss of his life. And maybe someone else has to take care of his family. I don't know. But if you take this view of death... that it comes at the Lord's right time. Then every tragedy that is seen in the light of the resurrection and the promises that come to us following the resurrection of all people and those who believe enter into everlasting life. Well, you see that if death is seen in the light of that, it is much easier to take. And that's why we comfort people. I, I must apologize. Uh, Martha, Pastor Vince's wife, uh, her father died and they have uh, are flying today to Minnesota to be with the family and to go to the funeral. And I forgot to include that family in our prayers. Lord God, please go with Vince and Martha and their family as they travel and keep them safe from harm and bring them safely back to us that they may serve you in the ways that you have called them. Through Jesus name we pray, amen. Now, pardon me for leaving that off this morning. I was assembling a prayer list and I didn't get, get that on there. I don't have any other details. I asked for details, but I don't hear anything yet. Let's go on. Uh, they spoke the word of the Lord. They preached what God has given them to preach. And, and they came to faith. 
So that's the who that was prayed and it was unexpected. It was not expected by Paul that the answer to his prayers to get out would result in his bringing the household of this jailer. They're not given a name, are we? To faith. And that should encourage us to pray for people who are in very kinds of various kinds of difficulties and depression and fear and various uh, threats to the body and to the soul. Let's go on to Acts chapter 20. Um, who's there that can unmute? <laughs> I think you can all unmute now. And uh, someone read Acts 20, please. How about Robert Clem? Let him read it. <laughs> Robert, are you there? Bobby? No, he's not. He's sometimes multitasking. <laughs> I can read again if you'd like. I would. Go ahead, Joanne. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard, in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the words he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to, his, to the ship. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now what uh, I'll give you the background very briefly. Uh, this is uh, takes place not in Ephesus, but at a port. Um, let's vis visualize Turkey and uh, visualize the Mediterranean Sea. Okay. And I don't remember, is it the Aegean Sea? I believe so, because the Adriatic is by is over on the, by Italy. So they are there at the port. I think it's Miletus. And Paul stops there to visit and to encourage the elders who are serving the church at Ephesus, the church that he started, the church to which he had written a letter. And he stops to strengthen them and to pray with them. It's a very emotional scene because Paul and they all realize that they probably wouldn't see him again. I don't know how they knew that. God. Um, say something here. Oh, well, this is different. I'm sorry. But the they prayed and um, we aren't told what they prayed. I would suppose for strength and for the help to continue to preach the word. Um, I just want to interject something about Ephesus. Um, so there might have been a, a, a port, but I was there. A lot of people have gone there. Um, and what they told us when we were there is that the in those days, the sea or the ocean or whatever it was came right up to Ephesus, that, that it has changed in the 2,000 years. Oh, yes. Uh, the account in the book of Acts, if you read in the verses just before, is, is uh, they stopped it. Uh, I, I think I'm correct. I should have a map, but I don't in yeah. front of me at Miletus. Uh, and the elders came down there. It, it could be that Paul does not have his own ship. Do you realize that when you want a book passage, uh, and go someplace in the first century that you don't call the um, cruise director. <laughs> <laughs> you go down to the port and you wait to see if a ship has room for you that's going in your direction. It's kind of like hitchhiking. It's not free. You, you pay for your, your uh, privilege of going, but that's how they got around. And if you read the book of Acts, uh, Paul has got, uh, he has a lot of traveling to do. 
and, and sometimes it, it takes two or three ships to get him back to where he is going. And sometimes he says, no, I'm, I'm going to walk. So he gets off the ship and he goes on land and then he meets some more people. It, it just, I guess you'd say you can't keep up with this guy. If he had lived another 20, 30 years, he, he might have started 5, 10, 20 more churches. I don't know. We will never find out. But um, he is what we call today a church planter, and he is an encourager. And if you read what he, what he writes in his 13 letters, you get a sense of the strength of this man, of his faith and his knowledge uh, and his willingness to serve and to exhort other believers. We're only touching the, the surface of this great missionary that was called by God to do great things for God, who is a great God. Well, they prayed, and what happened is that his the prayers were answered according to God's will. We don't know the results, except that after this, the next thing that happens is Acts chapter 21. When our days there in Tyre were ended, we departed and went on our journey, and they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship and returned home. <laughs> this is a very similar uh, incident to the one we just discussed. We aren't told what they prayed. We aren't told what the result was. And they went back home. Home for Paul is now Antioch, but his original home was Tarsus, Paul of Tarsus. Let's see where we are in Acts chapter 22. When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him. Who is him? Wow. Lord. Yeah, pray, Lord. saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. Now, let me tell you what this is. If you read Paul's accounts of his, uh, how he was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles, he tells that story three times. Well, he may have told it 20 times, but Luke records it three times in the book of Acts. And each time it's a little bit different. If you sum them up, you get the whole story. I'm not sure if I'm saying this uh, uh, clearly, but this in Acts 22 is the second time that he tells the story. The second time. The last time he was, he's before King Agrippa. I think it's Acts 26 or 27. So he was in Jerusalem and he was praying in the temple. And Jesus comes to him and says, get out of Jerusalem quickly. He's, it, Jesus is saving him from death. So he says, Lord, they know that in one synagogue after another, I was in prison and I beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And there the artist has depicted Paul not doing the stoning, but approving it. <coughs> and then well, the Lord said, act, uh, go ahead, Chris. This act, this particular thing is before Paul was uh, met by the Lord. This is his, his first meeting with the Lord as the Lord appears to him and blinds him. You have to read Acts 9 to get... He was in Jerusalem? I thought he was on his way somewhere else. He is he? on his way to Damascus. <laughs> oh. this, time, this time he is returning to Jerusalem and he has another encounter. Oh, okay. And, and this encounter is when he also says that the reason that I am in trouble everywhere I go is that they know that 
I was killing the Christians. It's a little confusing unless you take all three accounts, sum them up together. So thank you for clearing that up, uh, Chris. It was a good question. The Lord said, go and I will send you far away to the Gentiles. You know, we're, we're, we're just running out of time here. I'm going to quickly go to Acts 28 in the neighborhood of that place, Malta, where lands belonging to the chief man of the island named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery. And Paul visited him and prayed and putting his hands on him, he healed them. He healed him. So here we have another case of Paul praying for healing and God gave him that gift of healing. And the result was that the man was healed. It's a very simple thing. Uh, Paul did this everywhere he traveled, but we are given this incident. So these are the prayers in the book of Acts. And we're coming up on the end of our hour together. And I want to emphasize again that answered prayers are not the proof that prayer works, but the evidence to our hearts that God loves us so very much and does indeed hear and answer according to his will. When our God, the great God who created us and redeemed us by the blood of Christ says to us, call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you and you will glorify me. He is laying out a huge in invitation and he is saying to us in the way that I've paraphrased this whole Bible study, the Lord loves to hear us pray. I don't lay the law upon you, but the gospel. And the part of the gospel that I'm giving you today is listen to his invitation. All right. Lord God, thank you for this invitation to pray with all our hearts and with all our minds, with all our souls to love you and to not love our neighbor as ourselves. And in that loving our neighbor, help us to know the needs of our neighbors, the ones close and the ones far away, those who are fellow believers in Jesus, help us to know their needs so that we might pray for them. Widen our prayer list and show us, show us please, how you answer our prayers too. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Everybody said amen. Amen. Amen.